This morning, my wife asked me, she said, are you going to wear a jacket? Because all the other speakers are wearing jackets. And I said, you know, no, no way. Because they told me I was supposed to talk about solidarity today. And so if I'm going to have to talk about solidarity with all these low-rent urban people, I want to look as lousy as you do. So I, I, I got to tell you, I'm really, as you might imagine, I'm really happy to be here tonight. I really am. But I, I got to tell you, it is really tempting in this room for me to tell some inner city miracle stories. Right? right? You, I mean, you know the kind I'm talking about, right? I mean, it's tempting for me to just load up, you know, and, and do, you know, tell you about this homeless woman we, we picked up who turned her life around and started selling Amway. And last year, that woman tied $300,000 to our ministry. Praise God. <laughs> you, you know where I'm going with this, right? You know, about, the, the, about all the drug dealers on the corner near my house and how last year I walked up to them and said, put those guns away, boys. It's repentant time. And they fell down around me on their knees. And I led them all to Christ. And I want you to know I'm here to tell you that those five young men are all at the Harvard Medical School now learning how to prescribe legal pharmaceuticals in the name of Jesus. Right? You know these stories. You tell these stories. Now, and I'm going to be honest with you. I used to be really good at telling stories like that back when I was the president of Mission Year. When I was in charge of Mission Year, I was recruiting all these young people to spend a year living and working among the poor, and I was raising the money once I recruited them to make it happen. And when you're recruiting and raising money, well, you tell those stories. And a few years ago, it dawned on me that I had gotten so good at managing that organization and, and at telling you know, and it talking to young, going around the country and talking about loving poor people. I got so good at raising money to love poor people and recruiting people to love poor people that it dawned on me that I, I, I didn't actually know any poor people anymore. You know? Somehow, I went from being an urban missionary to being a faith-based nonprofit executive. And I didn't notice because I still lived in a neighborhood where I got my car stole once in a while. And I was still telling 10-year-old miracle stories. Now that, that's, I, I mean, I got to tell you, that's the danger of all these programs we, CCD, C, we CCDA types are pushing on each other here. The danger of all these programs is, is that if you're not careful, they can end up separating you from the very people that you're supposed to be identifying with. I mean, I mean they, talk, they want me to talk about solidarity tonight, but it's hard to be in solidarity with someone when you're always so busy meeting all their needs. The programs. Some of you know what I'm talking about because you've had your own midlife crises. I was looking at Wayne over there. Wayne, you remember your midlife crisis, right? Way back. <laughs> You know, what I'm, I mean, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you wake up one day and, you, and all of a sudden you look around and you go like, wait a second. How did I end up here? This isn't who I was going to be. This isn't what I was going to do. I was going to be something else. I was going to do something. How did this happen? And, and in the middle of mine, Eventually, I, I mean, when, when you realize you, 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 you lost it, man. You, you, somehow you got drifted away from who you were going to be. And eventually I got so down, so down, that my wife and my kids sat me down. And they said, look, if you're so miserable with what you're doing, quit. I mean, if you're so, if you're so down, listen, if you want to go back to street level, if you want to go back to living with poor people, We'll go. We'll go with you. Just stop staring out the window and shaking your head. <laughs> so, so my friend Leroy Barber took over Mission Year. Um, some of you know Leroy, and I got to tell you, Mission Year is still the best introduction to urban ministry for young people that I know. And he took that over, and my family and I, we, 
we moved here to Cincinnati to live in community with a handful of friends in a little neighborhood up the hill called Walnut Hills. I gotta be honest with you, four years later, the closest thing we have to a program is a weekly dinner party that includes a bunch of our ghetto neighbors. You know, we, we eat dinner. And, and, it, and it's funny because, you know, when, when I talk about this Monday night dinner party that we have at a place like this, nobody's really that impressed. You know, people are like, well, so what? But man, when i out there, when I take that to a mainstream evangelical church, they get so excited. They go, praise the Lord, brother. You have planted an inner city church. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're an urban church planner. And I always laugh when people tell me that I planted a church. Because I got to tell you, man, if you came to one of our dinners, you would know it was no church. <laughs> I, mean, it's not, I mean, like, you know, we're not one of those ministries that has, like, former drug dealers and former prostitutes. Oh, our people are still working. And, and, I mean, people that know me know, like, we don't sing any songs. We don't pray, you know. We don't, we, there's no hymns. There's no, lit I mean, I don't preach any sermons. I mean, when we, have, when we have dinner, we have dinner. We eat. That's it. Afterwards, we play some goofy game, give a few announcements. I mean, that's the closest I come to preaching. It's like right at the end, I just say, like, don't hurt anybody this week. Bye. But you know, it's funny, when you go to the evangelicals, man, that doesn't bother them. They say, oh, well then, uh, well then it's an outreach ministry, praise God. You're doing outreach. And then they ask the question that people like that always ask people like us, right? You know, you know what they ask. So brother, are you making a difference? So brother, are you having an impact in that ghetto? Are you seeing lives change? Right? How many times do you get asked that question? Now listen. If I was still raising money and recruiting people, if I was still running some big ministry organization, I'd tell you one thing. But the truth of the matter is, all my friends and I, we all got regular jobs. So we don't need your money. So I can tell you the truth. So you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I mean, if you want, if you want for kicks sometime, you should, you should get my email newsletter. You just, it's the walnuthillsfellowship.org. You should read it. It's the only honest newsletter out there. Because I don't need your money. Money changes everything. I don't need your money, so I'll tell you the truth. And the truth is no. 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 Not so much. We're not changing anybody's life. We're not having some big impact. We're not transforming Walnut Hills. No. What are you talking about? If you, knew, if you knew my people, you would understand. I mean, Richard eats with us sometimes. He's one of the older guys who sits on milk crates up the block, you know, drinking malt liquor out of a paper bag. You know, they're all up there. They never talked to me until one day I came out of the corner store and I left my Dr. Pepper in the bag. <laughs> Walked up and said, yo, can I drink with you guys? They're like, yeah, sure, sit down, you know. And, and, and they all said I could sit down, but Richard's the one who really sort of, I got to know the best. You know, Richard's, his mother was a prostitute who left him when he was 15. He's been out on the streets for more than 30 years. He's been shot three times. He's been stabbed three times. He's been in and out of jails. He's been in and out of shelters. He's been in and out of churches. He can't read. He's lost most of his teeth. He's addicted to alcohol. He's never had a job with a paycheck. And he's never had a relationship with a woman that didn't end in physical violence. Okay, he's 50 years old. He looks like he's 70. Now here's the thing. Like, I hate to break it to you, but Richard's not going to end well. Okay? Like, he's cooked. You say, what's going to happen? It's happened. He's done. His ticket has been punched. What are you talking? He's not going to end up a deacon in somebody's church, buying a house, reconciling with his kids. 
You want to know the difference I've made in Richard's life? The difference my, my friends and I have made in Richard's life? The only difference is this, is when he sees me coming up the street now, he, he stands up. He puts out his arms because he knows I'll hug him. That's it. That's it. Now, of course, some of you, I mean, you guys, some of you have been in this game long enough to know it doesn't always take 50 years for somebody's ticket to get punched, does it? It doesn't always take that long. Got another woman in the fellowship. We, we got to know Selena two summers ago. She was 26 years old, but she already had four kids by three different men. And when they got evicted, when she and her kids got evicted, she was off her meds. And so she smashed out a window when she got the notice. And she picked up the glass and she just started cutting herself, trying to kill herself right in front of the four little ones. So they're just watching their mom bleeding all the death. Her, her, her boyfriend showed up and he called the cops and they came and they carted her away. The next morning, they patched her up and they brought her back. They dropped her back off the next morning. Said, hope it works out for you. That's, health, that's mental health care in our country. So, so one of our neighbors calls, calls and says, you guys better get up here. So we went, even though, to be honest with you, that's not how we like to meet people. I mean, honestly, it's nice to help your friends, but helping people isn't a very good way to make friends. Because the relationship's that from the start. And so I don't like to meet people that way, but that, that, so we went up there. And in the end, we hooked her up with a new place and got her some new furniture. And I was in her place. It's about a block from my house. I was there a couple, mu- couple months ago. And the boyfriend's on the couch watching hardcore pornography. While Sarita, Selena's sitting at the table smoking a cigarette in the face of the baby. And the four-year-old, Rayshawn, he's running around with a bottle full of Kool-Aid. It's 10 in the morning. Now, he, I can tell you right now, Rayshawn is not going to be the president of the United States, okay? Rayshawn's not going to graduate from high school. Rayshawn's not even going to be able to support himself, okay, ever. And then you say, are you saying that just because he's being neglected? And he's, no, no, forget the neglect. The kid was born with fetal alcohol syndrome. He, his ticket was punched before he even got born. So what's the point? Here's the point. The other night at dinner we had lasagna. And Rayshawn loves lasagna. And he ate two helpings. And afterwards the adults, we fixed it so that he would win the game. And he was thrilled. See, I can't fix his future. But he had a good night. I, I, and, I, and I know, I'm like, I know this isn't what you expect when you come to CCDA. And, 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 and you're saying, what are you saying? Don't you believe in God? Bart, don't you believe in miracles? Yeah, I, I'm not saying miracles don't happen. I, I've been in this game for 20-some years. I've seen miracles happen. I mean, you don't have to. You, I mean, I've seen kids from backgrounds worse than that come out and become amazing people in ministries like the ones you guys run. Don't know. I believe in miracles. I've seen them happen. I'm not saying miracles don't happen. I'm just saying they call them miracles for a reason. It's because they don't usually happen. They, they, they don't usually happen. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't think God's holding out. I don't, I don't think God's up there going, oh, you five have cancer. Let's see. You die, you die, you die. Hey, a lot of friends are praying for you. You will heal and have a miracle. You die. Come on. Come on, do you really? I mean, I don't, I, I believe in a God who is always doing his best for us, who always wants to heal and always wants to love and always wants to save. Come on. Come on, no, the problem, the problem isn't that God isn't trying. The problem is God doesn't always get what he wants. Now, I know you're not supposed to say that. You know, people say, what about God's sovereignty? Sovereignty? You talk God's sovereignty? God isn't even sovereign in my life, and I want him to be. I surrendered my will. I surrendered my will to God. I said, God, please take me and use me. Lead me in your ways, right? And it doesn't happen. Every single day, I, Bart Campolo, flout the will of God. The almighty will of God. I, I put it aside. Hey, there are things God wants me to do, and every single day there are things God wants me to do, and I don't do them. And there are things he doesn't want me to do, and I do them. And so do you. Especially you. I was looking at you. No, I know. I know you flout the will of God. Don't you? Admit it. Admit it. 
So here's the thing, right? You don't do what he wants you to do. I don't do what he wants you to do. She's not doing what he wants you to do, right? So, so every, we're all flat in the world, and yet collectively we think God's will is done in the world? You gotta be kidding. You, I mean, you say, well, what, what are you talking about? Listen, I, I played basketball when I was a kid. I played basketball in high school, and they taught us something in basketball. What they taught us was, is that at the end of each half, okay, when there's like two or three seconds to go in the game, you know what you do? No matter where you are on the court, what do you do? You shoot! You throw the ball. And why do you, yeah, and you say, do you think it's going to go? No, you're 90 feet away. You throw it over your head. It doesn't matter. You shoot. And you say, do you think it's going to go in now? But once in a while, what? Once in a while it goes in. And the crowd goes wild. And they, reach, and they show it on ESPN and they say, it was a miracle shot. You know what I think? I think God's always trying. And once in a while, you do what he wants you to do. And I do what he wants me to do. And she shows up right when he, when he told her to show up. And it all comes together. And God's will is actually done. And when that happens, the Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying there's no miracles. What I'm saying is this, is that I think miracles are miracles even for God. I think miracles are miracles even for God. So the ministry I relate to at this stage in my life is Mother Teresa. Remember her? Some of you, I know some of you are young and you're like, you heard of her. But do you remember? I mean, her, what was her ministry? She would go around the streets of Calcutta, what? Scooping up people dying in the gutter. People, you know... People starving to death, dying of AIDS, covered with flies, you know, anonymous dying people. And she'd bring them back to her convent, and she and her nuns, they would wash them. They would clean, wash them gently. And then they would put them in clean pajamas and put them in a bed with clean sheets and tuck them in there. And she would park a nun by the bed to hold their hand and stroke their hair and whisper to them that God loved them until they died. And if you'd have said to Mother Teresa, do you think you can save all these people? She would have said, oh no, they're terminally ill, they're done. She says, she says, the thing is this, it's not, I can't stop him from dying, but nobody should die like that. Nobody should die alone. She, she used to say that sometimes our job is to accompany the poor on the last stage of a very difficult journey. And I guess, I guess that's what I'm saying is that Martin Buber said it well. Martin Buber said, now, you know, Martin Buber didn't say it as well as this. You know, I mean, honestly, I'm trying to think, like, what am I actually trying to communicate to you? Here it is. What I'm trying to communicate is this. Is there are some people you can't fix. And there are some people you can't help. And there are some people you can't save. But there's nobody. Nobody. You can't love. You can love anybody. Buber said it this way, he, he, in, 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 when he was writing about I and thou, he said, he said, most of the human relations we have aren't human relationship at all. We relate to each other as functions. You know, you're a bank teller, you're a car fixer, you're a, you're a house cleaner, and the people, we relate to each other in terms of our functions and our objects. But Buber said, once in a while, you connect with somebody. Once in a while, the eyes lock, and from the depth of your, of your innermost self, you connect with the depth of their innermost self. That, that in a sense, my Bartness connects with your Jonas. And we bond in its space. And, and Buber said, that's when it's I and thou. And I guess what I'm saying is, is that I think sometimes ministry is scooping up a bunch of people that the world treats like objects and not very valuable objects at that and, and creating a context in which they can be known as thous, as people. Even it, it, you may not be able to change their lives, but you can create that space. I, I, I was trying to think, like, how do I communicate this? And then I thought, wait a second. You remember that cheer show? Remember the one about the bar? Do you remember the song? He said, sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see what? Our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. The cl those relationships. See, that's the danger of all this programming. 
The danger of all this programming is, is you just get so busy helping groups of people and, and moving statistics up the ladder and, and, and doing systemic change and community development that sometimes you forget to know people by their name, to look into them and be with them and be one with them. And, you know, some of you say, like, this is good. Some of you know better. Some of you know that if you get, if you get around the corner, if, if, if you step around the table and you start having those kind of relationships, it's going to get real messy. I mean, that's the nice thing about programs, is they create real neat boundaries for our relationships. I will do this for you, I will not do this for you. I will see you here, and I will not see you there. But when you just live with folk, and you, and you aren't running any programs that define the relationship, it can get real messy. And the messier it gets, the more you're going to need your community. People say, why are you in Cincinnati? I'm in Cincinnati because I got a handful of friends here to live with. You know, and I, I, I just got to say, I love, I love the three R's, but I'll tell you what, that relocation R, I'll tell you what, that is insanity unless you go with some folk. You just go relocate by yourself, you will be done in a couple of minutes. The bottom line is, is loving poor people is a team sport. And it's completely unsustainable unless you got friends all loving the same people together so that you can come home and go like, Joey, man, I hate that guy. <laughs> and somebody can go, listen, dude, I'll go talk to Joey right now. <laughs> Two years ago, I was eating breakfast with my kids at the, you know, before school, and a knock comes at the door. And a knock comes at the door every every day, because there's this little kid in our fellowship, she's 12 years old, and she goes to the same school as my kids, and my daughter was driving to school, so she drives them all together. So, you know, and, and, and Tanya, she's, she's 12 years old. She's, she's, she's like, she's this kid coming up in the worst kind of family. You know, she's got this abusive mother who's n n mentally handicapped and physically abusive and there's no food in the house. And, and, and I mean, I've been with them. They just fight all the time. And I, I've been with them when the mother just looks at her and says, you little brat, I wish I'd aborted you when I had a chance. And she means it. So I got, but she goes to school with my kids, so I open the door. And there's Tanya, but there's Terry with her. And this is shocking because Terry never shows up in the morning. I said, what's up? And she says, Tanya got raped in the building last night. Just thought you ought to know. As soon as she said that, man, my heart just went to the floor. Because they live in this rat hole apartment about a block from mine. You know, no, roaches and, 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 and no heat. They, oh, they heat it with the, the stove and all this stuff. And we had been fixing up an apartment. My friends and I were fixing up an apartment that we were going to move them into later on that summer. And as soon as she said that, I thought, What's the matter with me? I wouldn't leave my daughter in that building five minutes. And I, I was willing for her to stay there a couple of months until we got around to fixing the place up. And it's too late. And they got her. So there's my Monday, right? right? You're off to the, we go to the hospital and the nurse is coming and do the rape kit. And then, the, then the, the, the police come and we do the interviews. We were there all day. By the time we got home, then I'm trying to figure out where am I going to take them? Because I can't take her back to the building, right? She just got traumatized there. So I call home, and I'm talking to my wife. And finally, my, my son she says, look, she, look, I'll sleep on the couch. She can, they can have my room. It's fine. But the mom won't go. I said, what do you mean? She says, she says I've got to stay in the apartment and protect the TV set. If I leave there, they'll come and steal the TV. Your daughter just got raped 24 hours ago, and you're worried about the TV set. So that's where we're at. So it's fine. She goes to the apartment. Tanya comes to our place. And all that week, we're going to like rape crisis centers and counselors and cop appointments until it comes to Thursday. And on Thursday, we got to go back to the hospital for the interview. Because any of you know this about sexual trauma victims. What they do with the little kids is they'll have a, a trained counselor come in and they interview them on videotape to talk about what happened so that if it comes up in court, they can play the videotape and the kid doesn't have to appear. It's a big deal. So Tanya's upstairs getting ready, and I'm like, come on, come on, we got to go, come on, we got to go. And, and she's slow, and, and so she comes down, we get in the car, we go up to pick her mom, and her mom is furious. She goes, you're late, you're late. And I said, listen, we're, we're fine, we got enough time, we'll make it all right. She said, I have to be back here by noon for my Section 8 meeting. I, if I lose my Section 8, they're shutting down this building. If I lose my Section 8, I'll be in trouble. Yeah, I got to be back. And I said, look, Terry, we ain't going to be back by any 12 o'clock. This could take all day. I said, look, give me the guy's number, I'll call him, I'll fix it. Because sometimes that's what you do. You just 
take the phone. So I call the guy, sure, no, oh, we'll move to the next day, fine. I say, we're okay. But she won't stop yelling at me. Yeah, I got, she just keeps, and finally I said, look, leave me alone. I didn't do anything wrong. And she said, I'm not mad. I said, what are you mad at me for? She said, I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at the little bitch in the back seat. I said, what? She said, yeah, if she didn't have to go out and play with her friends, she wouldn't have got raped in the first place, and I wouldn't have to be moving. She's blaming a little girl. So that was it for me. I'm done at this point. I pulled the car over, turned off. She says, what? I, I looked at her, I said, shut up, woman. You stupid woman. You shut up. I never want to hear that trash out of your mouth again. You idiot. I tell you what, there's only one person to be mad at in this whole wide world, and he's not in this car right now. She's a little girl. She's allowed to go out and play without worrying that some old man's going to drag her in an apartment and bust her up. I said, you shut up, you idiot. I looked at the little girl. I said, your mother's so stupid. Don't you listen to her. Now, I know that's not good ministry practice. <laughs> I know this is, you know, they don't, they don't have a seminar on cursing out the people in your ministry. <laughs> but man, you know, I just felt like somebody needed to stand up for the little girl. You know, there are a lot of women in this room who got sexually ab ab abused and molested and got blamed for it. And I'm here to tell you, if nobody else ever tells you this, it's never your fault. <laughs> so man... So I, I got done yelling at her. I turned back on the car. We drove off to the hospital. And, and, and they took Tanya into the interview. And then I'm sitting in the waiting room with, with, with Terry. And she's angry. I'm angry. We just sat there in silence for about an hour and a half. And it, until it hit me. Until the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Until I got it. And all of a sudden I look up at her and I said, Terry, this happened to you, didn't it? And she looked up and she said three times, First time I was nine. Second time I was 11. Third time I was 19. There's three of them. And they put me in the hospital for three months. <sighs> yeah, whenever you see a monster out there, you look real careful. Because I'll tell you what, every child molester I ever knew, every abuser, every abusive parent, I saw, I, the only one thing they all got in common, and what's that? Yeah, somebody got to them first. Nobody wakes up some morning and says, I want to be an evil monster. I looked at her, I said, Terry, when this happened to you, who helped you? Who did you tell? And she looked up at me as cold as you've ever seen anyone look at anyone. And she said, I'm telling you. I didn't know what to say. I mean, I tried to say some, con well, what do you say? I mean, what, what, I'm going to come back 35 years later and fix it? We sat there. Tanya came out, we got in the car, we went back. The one thing I knew to do was I dropped Tanya off first. Dropped a little girl at my house, and I drove Terry back to the apartment. I walked her up to the door. By this time, I'm just wrung out, man. I'm done. I've had enough. I just said to her, look, Terry, this was a crappy day. It's a crappy week. I'm really sorry I yelled at you, but like, maybe tomorrow will be better. I got to go. I made her about halfway down the stairs, and she yells, boy! What? Boy! It's coming. I said, what? She goes, what about my hug? Right, because we hug people. I got to say, uh, and you think, oh, be, I didn't want to hug this woman. I, I just wanted to get out of there. Fine, wait, if that's what it takes. So I walk up the stairs. I give her, fine, got to go, bye. I turn, and I'm, I'm almost to the stair, and she, uh, she says, Bart! I said, what? She says, I love you. Now, this is significant, you see, because I've known Terry for four years, and I'd never heard her say those words to anyone. I mean, honestly... I, I know she's never said them to her daughter. It's a, I take her daughter to counseling, and it's a huge bone of contention for the kid. Her mother has never once said, I love you. I've never heard her say it to anyone. And there she is saying, I love you. Now, I wish I could say to you, oh, and my heart was warmed, and I went back, and I, man, I just said, whatever, got to go. I was halfway home before this Bible verse came to me. Halfway home, and all of a sudden, it, 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 you, you know the verse. First John. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and all those who love are born of God and know God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And I'm sitting out there, I'm going, wait a second, wait a second. If Terry loves me, then she's born of God. 
if Terry loves me, then, then she knows God. No, no, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you that Terry's a Christian. I don't know what Terry believes. I, I have no, she's still the worst mother I've ever seen. She's, a, she's still a drunk. I, oh, I'm not telling you I led her to Christ. All I'm telling you is her love for me that day gives me hope. And your love, your love for the people in your world gives me hope. And God's love for all of us gives me hope. Gives me hope. Now listen, I, I, I'm not the guy with the bumper sticker, all right? I'm not the guy, you know, I, I really believe in God's love, but I'm not sure it wins. Not in the here and now. Where I live, God's love doesn't win very often in the here and now. Once in a while, you love somebody and you get a miracle, but most of the time you love somebody and they still go down the tubes. But whether or not God's love wins in the here and now, I believe that love will win in the end for everybody. Even the most broken and battered and wrecked and, and broken beyond repair of us, I believe that love will win in the end. That's what I believe. In Jesus' name, amen. What should be unique about the way Christians serve the poor is that they, the person whom they follow, Jesus Christ, used language in scripture that describes that when they serve the poor, they're not actually serving somebody else, they're actually serving him. When you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. A lot of times people feel like you're not part of society, like you're the scum of the earth. I'm challenged to serve like that person in front of me is Christ. Good evening, sir. God bless. As you know, the lady that probably barely afford groceries herself was stopping help. It's an odd way of describing service to the poor. As you'll see some of these other people, they'll pretend like they're on cell phones, they'll pretend like all of a sudden they have to change the radio station and they don't know how. Do I dare minimize his challenge to view them as the Christ, the Messiah himself, so that I can feel less challenged by that scripture. I've had piss thrown on me. I've had people whip out their private parts on me. You know, I've had people cuss me out. I get the finger. Well, so many times I can't count on my fingers how many times I got the finger. And I would, wouldn't dare to say that that means that every person on the corner, we need to find some kind of relationship, a way to be connected to them. Um, as much as just acknowledge, I mean, the acknowledgement of that person existing with you. Instead of staring at the sign, and just stare at you, and stare at you, and stare at you, acknowledge you and say, hey, well, I'm gonna, hey, God bless, I ain't got it, but hey, have a great day. When I'm not connected to the human experience of others, then we need help.